Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at The Shoemaker's Holiday or a pleasant comedy of The Gentle Craft uh, by Thomas Decker with in 1599 and uh, we are uh, we're yeah rapidly running out of the 16th century I mean where did it where did it go I mean <laughs> oh, the time flies when you're having uh uh, a, a pandemic. Uh, so uh, to find out what this text is doing, uh, we are going to dig into it now uh, over three sessions uh, with these wonderful readers. And so reading today, the part of Simon Eyre is... Hello, Dan, actor based in Montpellier, France. Reading Hodge is... Hello, I'm Lynn. I'm a college composition teacher. I live in the northwestern United States. Reading uh, Lord Mayor and Dodger is hello i'm helen good i'm a historian and i'm currently in hull uh, reading furk is rachel actor on the east coast what the furk uh, reading lovell and warner is hi i'm american i'm slowly caffeinating or well recaffeinating very wise very wise i think i will do the same uh reading the prologue marjorie lacy hands is a uh, leaky chapel actor and translator in northwestern england reading some uh, introductory epistles uh to all good fellows and jane and sybil is sarah blake actor writer and director based in germany and uh, reading lincoln and hamon is alan who's had his chips in suffolk uh, and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading Skipper. I may read some other bits and bobs as well if I cannot redistribute them amongst the readers. We n you never know, we might have a bonus reader popping in as we go along. It's that kind of week. Uh, so without further ado, we are going to dive into the uh, the gentle craft and find out uh, how, uh, how it goes. But before we go into the actual performative text, we have a, a bit of an epistle here. Uh, so uh, uh, Sarah, epistle away, please. To all good fellows, professors of the gentle craft, of what degree soever. Kind gentlemen and honest boon companions, I present you here with a merry conceited comedy called The Shoemaker's Holiday, acted by my Lord Admiral's, Admiral's players this present Christmas before the Queen's most excellent majesty for the mirth and pleasant matter by Her Highness graciously accepted, being indeed no way offensive. The argument of the play I will set down in this epistle. Sir Hugh Lacey, Earl of Lincoln, had a young gentleman of his own name, his near kinsman, that loved the Lord Mayor's daughter of London. To prevent and cross which love, the Earl caused his kinsman to be sent Colonel of a company into France, who resigned his place to another gentleman, his friend, and came disguised like a Dutch shoemaker to the house of Simon Eyre in Tower Street, who served the mayor and his household with shoes. The merriments that passed in Eyre's house, his coming to be mayor of London, Lacey's getting his love, and other accidents with two merry three men's songs. Take all in good worth that is well intended, for nothing is purposed but mirth. Mirth lengtheneth long life, which, with all other blessings, I heartily wish you. Farewell! Uh, thus ends the epistle, mentioning uh, the three men's song uh, songs, uh, of which the the, the printed text uh, does give us two songs, of which we do not know for certain where they live in the text. We are going with why, where one editor happens to have landed them, but there is no deter absolute determinate fashion as to where they actually live, uh, beyond a vague uh, sense that they they exist somewhere, um, and it. Obviously, this is a more literary thing, but it's possible when the play was presented before the Queen that uh, an argument presenting the basic outline plot was ex in extant and passed around the room in, in various copies. That's not unknown for private performances. I don't know about public playhouses whether such things happened. I don't think they'd probably go to the expense or the pain or the misery. Uh, but for private performances, that might be actually a relatively legitimate piece of additional data that you might have. Uh, akin to a program um so think of yourself as the queen there just you know maybe just checking what's it about oh, oh right okay no, this, this is good this is good yeah, we approve uh, we'll have that one um uh any thoughts on on that uh, particular epistle did anyone want to throw anything in before we go into the play proper 
You don't have to. It's fine. It was quite nice. I like the way it said farewell. Uh, Eric. Just the argument makes me have already. I've got so many questions. A, a colonel disguised as a as as a duke uh, as a Dutch shoemaker because that can't possibly go wrong. Um, mm. Yeah, just I don't know. I I just like this plot already. Mm. Uh, Sarah. It'll be a perfect disguise, though, Eric. I mean, you know, it'll you know he'll he'll fool everybody with his with his shoemaker disguise um I, it was very jolly to read mm. <laughs> i have to say it was it was kind of fun it it's oh, i i always find um elizabethan prose really difficult but um because there are no st full stops it just goes on and on and on and on and on uh but it, yeah it was it was kind of fun you got the impression that this is a playwright who is quite satisfied with himself you know he's played before the queen he's got nothing to prove yeah He's he's quite he's quite happy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, okay, um, let us crack on to the prologue then. And this is the prologue as it was pronounced once again before the Queen's Majesty. As wretches in a storm, expecting day, with trembling hands and eyes cast up to heaven, make prayers the anchor of their conquered hopes. So we, dear goddess. Wonder of all eyes, your meanest vassals, through mistrust and fear to sink into the bottom of disgrace by our imperfect pastimes, prostrate thus on bended knees, our sails of hope do strike, dreading the bitter storms of your dislike. Since then, unhappy men, our hap is such that to ourselves no help can bring, but needs must perish if your saint-like ears locking the temple where all mercy sits refuse the tribute of our begging tongues oh grant bright mirror of true chastity from those life-breathing stars your sun-like eyes one gracious smile for your celestial breath must send us life or sentence us to death Sorry, I couldn't quite make you out there, Aliki. You you were so far up uh, uh, Eliza's arse there that you you were quite muffled. Um, <laughs> that's not an all-purpose uh, prologue, is it? It's a very specific. You want to you want to do some arse licking? Then that's the one to use. <laughs> Your sun-like eyes. Those life-breathing stars. Your sun-like eyes. Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah, laying it on thick, laying it on yeah. quite thick there. We have a, wait, wait, what, what, what was the printing year of this? Like, what's, what's that? Uh, I think it's probably just the year after. I think it's very tight 1600, on. Uh, which yeah. is, which is, I'm sorry. 1600 is the first one. Yeah, so, so pretty much bang on, you know, a few months after yeah. it appears. So she's like 66, 67 years old at this point. Hmm. I, I don't think her uh, ability to accept flattery got, oh, uh, no, no, got no, less no. over time. <laughs> that was, if, if anything, the reverse, but it's just... <laughs> mm. uh, okay, any any additional thoughts on that? Um, that very specific prologue that uh, I don't think uh, has that much utility. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> unless you have someone in the audience who you really want to play that too. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I think it would be fun to have like sort of someone dressed as like if you were performing oh. this, someone dressed as the queen that you could address that to, or even just like the 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 audience member that is worst dressed, <laughs> uh, kind of thing. <laughs> you just pinpoint like someone in the audience that you can play that to, and just sort of go, "You're, you know, whatever." I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You want to time it for latecomers, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we have been awaiting you. Oh. <laughs> You and your life-breathing stars, your sun-like <laughs> eyes, sit the f*** down. On bended knee. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, I'm thinking of learning that for latecomers. Okay, yeah, I like that. Um, uh, anyway, let's crack on with the play itself. Um, uh, it has been variously printed with different act uh, scene uh, layouts. So I'll give you the one that we've got in front of us and also just a running scene count. So scene one, uh, or act one, scene one, enter the Lord Mayor and the Earl of Lincoln. 
My Lord Mayor, you have sundry times feasted myself and many courtiers more. Seldom or never can we be so kind to make requital of your courtesy. But leaving this, I hear my cousin Lacey is much affected to your daughter Rose. True, my good Lord, and she loves him so well that I mislike her boldness in the chase. Why, my Lord Mayor, think you then a shame to join a Lacey with an Oatley's name? Ah, too mean is my poor girl for his high birth. Poor citizens must not with courtiers wed, who will in silks and gay apparel spend more in one year that I am worth than I am worth by far. Therefore, your honour need not doubt, my girl. Take heed, my lord, advise you what you do. A very unthrift lives not in the world than is my cousin. I'll tell you what. It is now almost a year since he requested to travel countries for experience. I furnished him with coins, bills of exchange, letters of credit, men to wait on him, solicited my friends in Italy, well to respect him, but to see the end. Scantily journeyed halfway through Germany, but his, all his coin was spent, his men cast off, his bills embezzled, and my jolly cuz, ashamed to show his bankrupt presence here, became a shoemaker in Wittenberg. Goodly sign for a gentleman of such descent. Now judge you the rest by this. Suppose your daughter have a thousand pound, he did consume me more in one half year, and make him heir to all the wealth you have, one twelve months rioting will waste it all. And seek, my lord, some honest citizen to wed your daughter to. I thank your lordship. Well, Fox, <coughs> I understand your subtlety. As for your nephew, let your lordship's eye but watch his actions, and you need not fear, for I have sent my daughter far enough. And yet your cousin Roland might do well, now he hath learned an occupation, and yet I scorn to call him son-in-law. Aye, but I have a better trade for him, I thank his grace. He hath appointed him chief colonel, of all those companies mustered in London and the shires about to serve his highness in those wars of France. See where he comes. Enter Lovell, Lacey, uh, Lacey and Askew. Lovell, what news with you? My lord of Lincoln, tis his highness will that presently your cousin ship for France with all his powers. He would not for a million, but they should land at Dieppe within four days. Go certify his grace, it shall be done. And exit Lovell, which is lucky because he's going to read a skew in a second. Now, Cousin Lacey, in what forwardness are all your companies? All well prepared. The men of Hertfordshire lie at Mile End. Suffolk and Essex train in Tothill Fields. The Londoners and those of Middlesex all gallantly prepared in Finsbury with frolic spirits long for their parting hour. They have their impressed coats and furniture and if it please your cousin Lacey come to come to the Guildhall, he shall receive his pay and uh, 20 pounds besides my brethren will freely give him to approve our loves we bear unto my lord, your uncle here. I thank your honour. Thanks, my good Lord Mayor. At the Guildhall, we will expect your coming. And exit the Lord Mayor. To approve your loves to me. No subtlety. Nephew, that twenty pound he doth bestow for joy to rid you from his daughter Rose. But cousins both, now here are none but friends, I would not have you cast an amorous eye upon so mean a project as the love of a gay, wanton, painted citizen. I know this churl, even in the height of scorn, doth hate the mixture of his blood with thine. I pray thee do so. Remember, cuz, what honourable fortunes wait on thee. Increase the king's love, which so brightly shines, and gilds thy hopes. I have no heir but thee, and yet not thee, if with a wayward spirit, 
their start from the true bias of my love. My lord, I will, for honour, not desire of land or livings, or to be your heir, so guide my actions in pursuit of France, as shall add glory to the Lacy's name. Guys, for those words, here's 30 Portuguese. And nephew Askew, there's a few for you. Fair honour, in her loftiest eminence, stays in France for you, till you fetch her thence. Then, nephews, clap swept wings on your designs. Begone, begone, make haste to the guild hall. There presently I'll meet you. Do not stay where honour beckons, shame attends delay. Exit Lincoln. How gladly would your uncle have you gone? True, cuz, but I'll reach his policies. I have some serious business for three days, which nothing but my presence can dispatch. You, therefore, cousin, with the companies, shall haste to Dover. There I'll meet with you. Or, if I fay past my prefixed time, away for France. We'll meet in Normandy. Twenty pounds my Lord Mayor gives to me, you shall receive. And these ten Portuguese, part of mine uncle's thirty, gentle cuz, have cared for our great charge. I, I know your wisdom hath tried itself in higher consequence. Cuz, I am who myself am yours, yet have this care to lodge in London with all secrecy. What Uncle Lincoln hath besides his own many a jealous eye that in your face stares only to watch means for your disgrace? Stay, cousin. Who be these? And these be a lot of people who are about to enter. But before we uh, we get into a very busy scene with pretty much everybody on, um, uh, let's just uh, take in uh, where we are. We're in London. I think we're in London. There's a lot of London things going on. A lot of mentions of London. I, I think we're in London. Are we in London? Uh, mentions of the Guildhall um, and uh, other other things to give us uh, a sense. There's uh, there's mustering uh, for wars in France. Uh, there's lots of stuff going on. Uh, thoughts on the room uh, about what's going on and uh, and. The uh, the various uh, the, the topics of discussion that are going on between these these I say it starts off with a relatively small number of people it eases us into some plot before in a moment it's going to throw lots and lots of people at us uh, thoughts in the room uh, about what's going on who people are who are you if you were reading a part um, what is your opinion of yourself and other people uh, Helen uh, the Lord Mayor. Um is trying to be polite, but obviously has absolutely no time for the nobility, who he regards <laughs> as superior in status possibly, but utterly feckless. And um, he... And, the, and Lincoln doesn't like him either. The Earl of Lincoln <laughs> thinks he's a... You, he's he's a fairly pointless person, <laughs> and um, between them, there 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 is enormous amount of politeness and absolutely no love lost. Mm, yes, because we got the odder side giving us what the Lord Mayor definitely thinks there about uh, about certain things there. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I think that's that's possible, um, but I don't know that the mayor necessarily has has disdain for the nobility generically he certainly doesn't want his daughter to marry the young reprobate Lacey but I think it could be limited to that that he he knows this 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 guy's a prodigal uh and he doesn't want him wasting his he, I'm sure the mayor thinks of it as his hard-earned money um so yeah, I think there's a number of ways you can play it. They can, I think you could play it that these two old guys are basically on the same side. They don't want this match to happen. But yeah, you could you could definitely, I think, mine some sort of tension between them, and and and, 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 and sort of a, a a class tension more generally. I, I I think you could do it, but I don't know that that's the only way you could do it. Well, he calls him a fox. His first aside says he's a fox. Foxes are not good. No, that's true. Mm, no. The no, early no, modern no, fox, no bad no guy. No, no decent like eating off a fox. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, other thoughts? Uh, Eric? Uh, in terms of as an intro into the play, it reminds me a bit of the sort of kind of 
device that we had for the I can't remember which play what, what the play title was but the Robin Hood play where you've got skeleton turning up um it, it is that kind of device where you kind of have people that might have been known to the audience <laughs> sort of um actually just standing up to speak their part but I, I, obviously this is a bit sort of out of time because they're talking about his highness rather than her highness so yeah um and also kind of it made me think also of you know if you know not me <laughs> of course which is um before this i'm guessing yeah uh, one of one of the problems of this play is um uh the 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 it it they they don't really nail down precise time things uh <clears throat> that 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 we, we we'll be able to absolutely narrow down precisely when all of the action of the play is happening we've got an approximate period and we have approximate idea which which walls but you know there there are walls in france yeah that's that's helpful <laughs> and that narrows down when this happens um but we can discuss that future <laughs> times uh let's uh, carry on with the action i think uh let's get a bit more data because the scene hasn't ended but a lot of people now enter enter Mar uh, simon air marjorie his wife hodge Burk, Jane and Ralph with a pair of shoes. Ah, leave whining, leave whining. Oh, away with this whimpering, this puling, these blubbering tears and, and these wet eyes. I'll get thy husband discharged. I want thee, sweet Jane. Ah, go to, go to. Master, here be the captains. Peace, Hodge. Hush ye, knave, hush. Here be the cavaliers and the colonel's master. Ah, peace, Ferk. Peace, my fine Ferk. Stand by with your pishery pashery. Oh, away. I'm a man of the best presence. I'll speak to them, and they were popes, gentlemen, captains, colonels, commanders. <clears throat> brave men, brave leaders, may it please you give me an audience. I am Simon Eyre, the mad shoemaker of Tower Street. This wench with the mealy mouth that will never tire is my wife, I can tell you. Now, here's Hodge, my man, and my foreman. Uh, here's Ferk, my fine Ferking journeyman, uh, and this is Blubber Jane. All we come to be suitors for this honest wraith. Keep them at home, and as I am a true shoemaker and a gentleman of the gentle craft, I spurs yourself, and I'll find you boots these seven years. Seven years, husband? Ah, peace, midriff, peace. I know what to do, peace. Truly, Master Cormorant, you shall do God good service to let Ralph and his wife stay together. She's a young, new married woman. If you take her husband away from her a night, you undo her. She may beg in the daytime, for he's as good a workman at a prick and an owl as any is in our trade. Oh, let him stay, else I shall be undone. Ay, truly, she shall be laid at one side like a pair of old shoes else, and be occupied for no use. Truly, my friends, it lies not in my power. The, the Londoners are pressed, paid, and set forth by the Lord Mayor. I cannot change a man. Why, then, you are as good be a corporal as a colonel if you cannot discharge one good fellow. And I tell you true, I think you do more than you can answer to press a man within a year at a day of his marriage. Ah, well said, melancholy Hodge. Grand mercy, my fine foreman. Uh, truly, gentlemen, it were ill done for such as you to stand so stiffly against a poor young wife, considering her case she is new married. But, but let that pass. I, I pray deal not roughly with her. Her husband is a young man, but newly entered. Uh, but let that pass. Ah, oh, away with your pishery, pashery, your, your poles and your edipoles. A peace, mid -aff. a silent Sicily bum trick. Let your head speak. Yay. In the horns, too, master. Too soon, my fine fact, too soon. Peace, scoundrel, see you this man? Captains, you will not release him. Well, let him go. Here's a proper shot, uh, let him vanish. Peace, Jane, dry up those tears. They'll make the, his powder dankish. Take him, brave man. Hector of Hack Troy was a hackney to him. Hercules and Terminant scoundrels. Uh, Prince Arthur's round table by the Lord of Ludgate never fed such a tall, such a dapper swordsman. Ah, uh, by the life of Pharaoh, a brave, resolute swordsman. Peace, Jane, I said no more, man knaves. See, see, Hodge, how my master raves in commendation of Ralph. Rave, thou art a gull, by this hand it now goest not. 
I'm glad, good Master Iyer, that it is my hap to meet so resolute a soldier. Trust me for your report and love to him. A small, a common slight regard shall not respect him. Where's thy name, Rafe? Is thy name Rafe? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Give me thy hand, thou shalt not want, as I am a gentleman. Woman, be patient. God, no doubt, will send thy husband safe again, but he must go. His country's quarrel says it shall be sh so. Thou to go by my stirrup, if thou dost not go. I will not have thee strike thy gimlet into these weak vessels. Prick thine enemies, Rafe. My lord, your uncle on the Tower Hill stays with the Lord Mayor and the Alderman, and doth request you with all speed you may to hasten thither. Cousin, let's go. Dodger, run you before. Tell them we come. This Dodger is mine uncle's parasite. Exit Dodger around there. The arrogantest varlet that e'er breathed on earth. He sets more discord in a noble house by one day's broaching of his pick thank tales than can be solved again in 20 years and he i fear shall go with us to france to pry into our actions therefore because it shall behoove you to be circumspect mm, fear not good cousin rafe hi to your colors Uh, oh, uh, you know, I, I must because there's no remedy, but uh, ge gentle master of my loving dame, uh, as you have always been a friend to me, so in mine absence, think upon my wife. Alas, my Rafe, she cannot speak for weeping. Ah, ah peace, you cracked goats, you, you mustard tokens. It's quite not a brave soldier. Go thy ways, Rafe. I, I, you better go. Oh, what shall I do? When is he gone? Why? Be doing with me or my fellow Hodge? Be not idle. Ah, let me see thy hand, Jane. This fine hand, this white hand, these pretty fingers must spin, must, must card, must work. Work, you bombast cotton candle queen. Work for your living with a pox to you. Hold thee, Rafe. Here's five, six pence for thee. Fight for the honor of the gentle craft, for the gentlemen shoemakers, the courageous cord wainers, the flowers of St. Martin's, the magnates of Bedlam, Fleet Street, Tower Street, and Whitechapel. Crack me the crowns of the French knaves, a pox on them. Crack them, fight by the Lord of Ludgate. Oh, I'll fight my fine boy. Here, Rafe, here's three two pence to carry into France. The third shall wash our souls at parting. Her sorrow is dry. For my sake, firk the bosom on key. Rafe, I am heavy at parting, but here's a shilling for thee. God send thee to cram thy slops with French crowns and thy enemies bellies with bullets. Oh, I thank you, master, and I thank you all. Now, now gentle wife, my loving, lovely Jane, rich men at parting give their wives rich gifts, jewels and rings to grace their lily hands. Thou knowest our trade makes rings for women's heels. Here, take this pair of shoes, cut out by Hodge, stitched by my fellow Firk, seamed by myself, made up and pinked with letters for thy name. Wear them, my dear Jane, for thy husband's sake, and every morning when thou pullst them on, remember me, and pray for my return. Make much of them, for I have made them so, that I can know them. From a thousand mo. <laughs> and a drum sounds. Uh, enter the Lord Mayor, the Earl of Lincoln, Lacey Askew, Dodger, and soldiers. They pass over the stage. Rafe Ralph falls in amongst them. Firk and the rest cry. Farewell. Etc. And so exuant. And uh, yes, thus we uh, come to the end of the scene. Uh, <laughs> with much craziness uh, going on there. Thoughts from the room, um, from Ayr's orations uh, to the, the various interactions from various uh, peoples. Um, yes, I totally missed Rafe, uh, Ralph. Um, so, um, yeah, that was that was a surprise for me, as it was for everybody else. Um, 
<laughs> and yes, excellent weeping at the end there, Sarah. I think that was uh, enti <laughs> that's entirely how the scene should go. And yeah, it's yeah. this little moment of, um, you know, stage business of the farewells and off they go uh, to, uh, and, and uh, yeah, Rafe. Will we ever see his like again? <laughs> Who knows? We'll find out later. Uh, Aliki, thoughts? Okay, so on the one hand, we have a posh young man who's meant to go off to war, and he's not going to go, at least not right yet. But yeah. Rafe doesn't have that choice. He has to go, will he, nil he. <laughs> um, I, I love the, they are but newly married, less than a year and a day. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, the injunction from from Firkin and, and whoever else it was that uh, Jane should put her, uh, <clears throat> well, should yeah. put a certain part of his bod her body to other uses with her husband away. Um, I, I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, could you uh, read out that passage uh, for, for explication? <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. I must have missed that bit. Uh, he said lying. Yeah. Uh, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, that... Uh, a lot of that scene is just sort of dense with sex jokes and so yeah you have to make a choice when you uh when you stage this like how much you know but on bump do you want to um play those the, you know jokes about entering and you know these sort of obvious double Pr entendres tricks and all yes. Uh, yes. yeah so you you want to hit those a little bit or do you just want to gloss over them as as if they're normal um dialogue and let your you know the dirty minded among your audience of whom i'm sure there will be many um pick that stuff up so yeah so how yeah yeah because is it sort of diegetic joking or is it uh audience to laugh joking because it's like ferk is ferk just doing terrible sex jokes and everyone else is just ignoring him um <laughs> Or is it yeah. designed to get laughs from an audience, or is it sort of somewhere in between? Because I think I think you're right. There is a trap here that you could fall into doing. <laughs> let's yeah. let's demonstrate every joke with physical actions, yeah. and the audience to lose the will to live. Because um, <laughs> oh, because there's nothing uh, less funny than hilarity. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're really good questions about tone of uh, of where, where do you place some of these things? Because um, some of it is very big and bold. I think uh, Sarah's choices with Jane, are, I, I think, are appropriate yeah. within there. Um, yeah. But then other things are, are not. And Air is so wonderfully over the top in many ways. But he has such a clearly defined relationship with his wife as well. I really like that. <laughs> uh, Alan, I think, was waving earlier than Helen. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I think feel that the scene would probably have been played certainly in the public playhouses, um, with a a lot of emphasis on the the sex gags. Um, whether they toned it down if the court performance is a moot point. Hmm. Oh, I don't think necessarily that's a distinction um, that, that that we need to make because I don't know that court and 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 playhouses are are as different as you'd think. Uh, it's not like today. Uh, Helen. Uh, there, uh, obviously, for the audience, this scene would be extremely familiar. There were levies going off to Ireland all the time and they were pressed men. Mm. They weren't volunteers. And mm. remarkably mm. few of them came back in yeah. one piece. Mm. Um, yeah if they came back at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we are talking about, about, about something um, whenever this play happens to be set, we're talking about something within the experience. Also, the, 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 the problem of, uh, of Rafe's wife, that she's now going to have to, her, her nice hands are going to have, are going to go. She's going to have to work um, or beg or sell herself. But um, the uh, I, air so far does nothing much. He reminds me very much of Hobson in the second part of You Know Not Me, You Know Nobody, um, full of enthusiasm and words yeah. endless words yeah yeah and and always telling everybody else shh, 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 i'm talking 
you know. Yes, mm. but I mean, calling your wife bum trinket, I think, is 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 beyond the pale. Well, at least not in public. Um, or, or it may be, it may but, have been her maiden name. <laughs> I mean, that may have been what she her maiden name, Cicely Bum Trinket. No, because she's Marjorie. Oh, she is. You're right. She's Marjorie. Yeah. Marjorie so, Bum Trinket. So it's a, um, so it's a gratuitous <laughs> insult. There's a name to conjure with, however. I do I, I like that very much. Um, but I, I, I just I'd want to uh, hone in on Helen's point about, you know, that there are stakes to this scene. For all the jollity, the jollity actually maybe is a bit forced because they're, yeah. they're trying to perhaps levy humour out of a situation that isn't necessarily that funny. So, there, yeah, there are there are potential levels here. Um, uh, Rachel's waving then Eric, I think. Uh, I could have imagined that. No, no from Eric. I'll go to Eric and then if Rachel changes. I was just going to mention the Star Chamber case that we read where uh, we had the whole sort of, you know, officers officers being bribed and sort of going, no, I didn't take the money. They just gave it to me. I, I, there, it wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't that they were doing it for, you know, to be discharged, to be able to go and do other things, um, which made me think of this scene as well. It was just kind of like, well, they didn't do that, obviously, on stage. But they could have done <laughs> uh but obviously they, they uh, rafe can't afford that um he just kind of wants he, he has to go and do these sort of things to presumably to earn a wage i i, I don't know there's no real explanation why he has to go off and fight he's either. pressed mm. yeah yeah scripted yeah he has no choice um... it's the law yeah. Right. Anyway, um, uh, Rachel, did you want to step in or uh, are we good? Um... Uh, I was just going to say, uh, to me, this the, the, uh, from the Night of the Burning Pestle, uh, where the, the citizen and his wife, this is what the this reminds me of so much, just because yeah. it seems like uh, the way the play within a play was going. Um, and I think we have another Rafe, so... I don't know. There's, there's something funny about that. Just the, it's a little nonsensical with the, the um, craftsman coming in, you yeah, know, and I, it's the craftsman's play. And uh, about this time, we've also got uh, you know the wonderful apprentices of London uh, in Edward the Fourth, and uh, you know there, there there is something building here about the, the the city that is coming up, which of course, Night of the Burning Pestle will will pull upon uh, later on because it was a much later play, uh, Aliki. It, we haven't had a full introduction of the the uh, upper class couple, the uh, Lord Mayor's daughter and the Count's, um, is he a Count? The Count's um, nephew. But we've definitely got a full introduction of a comedy couple. And I suspect Rafe is not, well, I suspect we're going to be seeing Rafe again, let's put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 indeed, oh. indeed. Uh, anyway, we need to move on. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Lynn, could you read in rows? Uh, as oh. a, we have lost a rose, and I think it doubles reasonably well with you. Um, so uh, uh, we're going into what in some versions is known as Act 2, Scene 1. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's just Scene 2, if we're going with a running total. Uh, and enter Rose alone, making a garland. Here, sit thou down upon this flowery bank and make a garland for thy lacy's head. These pinks, these roses, and these violets, these blushing gillyflowers, these marigolds, and fair embroidery of his coronet, carry not half such beauty in their cheeks as the sweet continent, countenance of my lacy dove. Oh, my unkind father, oh, my stars, why lowered you so at my nativity to make me love? yet live robbed of my love. Here, as a thief, I am imprisoned for my dear Lacey's sake within those walls, which by my father's cost were builded up for better purpose. Here must I languish for him that doth as much lament. I know mine absence has for him I pine in woe. Enter Sybil. Good morrow, young mistress. I am sure you make that garland for me. Against I shall be Lady of the Harvest. Sybil, what news at London? None but good. My Lord Mayor, your father, and Master Philpot, your uncle, and Master Scott, your cousin, and Mistress Frigbottom by Doctor's Commons, do all, by my troth, send you most hearty commendations. 
Did Lacey send kind greetings to his love? Oh, yes, out of cry by my troth. I scant knew him. Here I wore a scarf, and here a scarf, here a bunch of feathers, and here precious stones and jewels, and a pair of garters. Oh, monstrous! Like one of our yellow silk curtains at home here in Old Ford House, here in Master Bellymount's chamber. I stood at our door in Cornhill, looked at him, he at me, indeed spake to him, but he not to me, not a word. Marry, go up, thought I, with a onion. He passed by me as proud, Mary foe. Are you grown humorous? thought I, and so shut the door and in I came. Oh, Sybil, how dost thou, my lacy, wrong? My Roland is as gentle as a lamb. No dove was ever half so mild as he. Mild? Yea, as a bushel of stamped crabs. He looked upon me as sour as verjuice. Go thy ways, thought I, thou mayst be much in my gaskins but nothing in my nether stocks. This is your fault, mistress, to love him that loves not you. He thinks scorn to do as he's done to, but if I were you, I'd cry, go by, Hieronimo, go by. I'd set my old debts against my new driblets and the heir's foot against the goose giblets, for if I ever I sigh when sleep I should take, pray God may I lose my maidenhead when I wake. Will my love leave me then and go to France? No, no, not that. But I am sure I see him stalk before the soldiers. By my troth, he is a proper man, but he is proper that proper doth. Let him go snick up, young mistress. Get thee to London and learn perfectly whether my lacy go to France or no. Do this and I will give thee for thy pains my cambric apron and my Romish gloves my purple stockings and a stomacher. Say, wilt thou do this, Sybil, for my sake? Oh, will I, quotha? <laughs> oh, who suit? By my troth, yes, I'll go. A cambric apron, gloves, a pair of purple stockings and a stomacher. I'll sweat in purple, mistress, for you. I'll take anything that comes, a God's name. Oh, rich. A cambric apron. Faith. Then have it up tails all, I'll go jiggy joggy to London and be here in a trice, young mistress. And exit Sybil uh, jiggy joggy. Do so, good Sybil. Meantime, wretched I will sit and sigh for this lost company. Exit Rose. Um... Uh, I, I, you know, if if ever, I mean, we've got ro verse versus prose uh, in quite a clear distinction. I, I'm almost disappointed that Rose isn't in Fourteeners, frankly, considering the way it's <laughs> going on. <laughs> there you go. Um, I mean, there's, there's almost a trick missed there at the beginning of the scene when uh, Sybil comes on and says, you know, oh, well, uh, any news? Well, I've heard from your Lord Mayor, your father, Philpot, your uncle. My, I, I think that list should be longer. It's just... Uh, if you're there. And, 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 and is it La Lacey? 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 Yeah. <laughs> it's not a short list, so the joke is there, but I do wonder if uh, actually the, the player could improv a few additional names um, that are not Lacey's. Uh, Alan, then Eric. Yeah, well, our Uncle Tom Clogley was on other duty that day. Mm. Um, but I was just wondering whether Sybil's speech, the point at which it, the rhyme scheme changed, whether that was actually a snatch of song. It, sound, it sounded like it, didn't it? Mm. I thought it probably was. I mean, it kind of took me by surprise. So I didn't sing it, but I, yeah, I, it did feel like a song when I was reading it. Mm, yeah, I mean, especially as you know, following on from a bit of um, uh, Spanish tragedy, uh, you know, one of the one of the most famous uh, pseudo quotations. Um, so uh, yeah, we haven't, you know, statistically speaking, we should do the Spanish tragedy again sometime soon, just 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 to keep it in our minds because you know it's 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 so prevalent. It never um, goes Yeah, it's just yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. Eric Thenaliki. And I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I, I was just going to mention that this scene reminds me a bit of that ma the first mackerel scene in uh, The Malcontent. I, I think it's The Malcontent, where you've got like sort of women talking about clothing and how it should be worn and all that stuff, which isn't really what the scene is. this scene is about or that scene. But um, yeah, it just... So much, so much fashion stuff going on in here. My Cambridge imprint and my Romish gloves, my purple stockings and a stomacher. And it's like, 
Okay, keeping track of that is hard <laughs> if you if you if you yeah. don't know what it's what what's going on, sort of. It's yeah. that big status thing, isn't it? If you're poor and someone says, "I'm going to give you lots of re," you know, the the finest clothing ever. Um, it's just you, the the the, the mouth waters. Uh, Leaky, then Lynn, then Helen. <laughs> Uh, I had raised my hand originally to ask about the song, just as Alan did, but I'm going to note instead that the opposite of mild is sour. Verjuice mm. is made from unripe grapes or crab apples. It's a very sour juice that people used uh, where we now use vinegar pretty much. Um, so that was interesting. Mild must mean sweet. Mm. Uh, I mean, that that little bit of um, they're, they're proverbs, um, I think they're proverbial expressions at that point. Uh, so um, mm. which which sort of connects us with um, songs that sort of just nick random bits of lines from other songs, kind of. So if it is a song, then there's there's a certain logic to it. It might be that she's just quoting proverbs and it's not a song. Mm. Um, that that could be a logic. Anyway, Helen then Lynn. Uh, yes, I think that there's not only the women's clothing the cambric apron and stuff she keeps on i think there has to be a pause while sybil um where where rose white expects sybil to say yes and sybil waits after each item to see if there's any more coming um <laughs> but that we've also got a good description of lacy um mm. that he looks like one of their yellow silk curtains <laughs> He's got precious stones and jewels and a pair of garters and scarves and feathers and all sorts of stuff. And I think that I don't know exactly how right that is, but we've just seen Lacey going off to war. He may be rather well got up. Um, and he, we could even have Sybil in the previous scene so that he passes her by. And she leaves going the opposite direction to everybody else who leaves. Mm. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like that. Uh, Lynn, then Sarah, then Eric. Yeah, I, I was, wasn't was going to talk about this, but just in response to Aliki's very nice sort of micro observation there, I, I mean, I do think that that's a pair of opposites that the, the, the play is invoking sweet and sour gentle and sour the french word do or douce um means sweet literally like sugar or sweet music or gentle or soft it has that range of of meaning so yeah I, I do think there's an opposition between sweet and sour gentle and and bitter gentle and sharp um in the in in the wordplay there and, and i was going to respond to eric yeah all this like purple stockings and and a cambric apron a lot of people think and i and i think that clothes were really important in this period that mm -hmm. as markers of status and the, and the fact that uh, there's the beginning of a kind of economic shift from um agriculture to trade and that that economic categories were not as stable as they had been an upward mobility was a was more possible than before in cause of anxiety in the upper classes. So yeah, dress is really important. It comes up again and again in early modern drama. And expensive. Mm -hmm. Because it's so labor intensive that mm -hmm. before the industrial revolution, um, yeah. And, it's, and, it's, it's it's not like saying, I'm just gonna give you some clothes. The modern equivalent would be, I'm going to give you some haute couture. This is going to be a one of the kind <laughs> piece that is going to be ridiculously impossible to get. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you know the idea of Sybil actually wearing it out may may go horribly wrong uh, in a class <laughs> uh, uh, kind of way. Uh, Sarah, yeah, I also wanted to uh, comment on the on the clothing here and and what Eric and and Helen said especially, uh, and what Helen said about the fact that maybe she says you know I'll give you my cambric apron and then pauses. Because uh, I do, uh, <laughs> if you look at what she's got there, she's got a cambric apron, so like a, a cotton apron. And then Romish gloves, which I assume are like Italian leather. Um, then she's got purple stockings, you know, fantastically expensive and rare purple dye. And then a stomacher, you know, which, which you know, quite often stomachers were embroidered and like, you know, beautifully uh, decorated. So, so this list gets more and more expensive and exclusive the, the more it goes on. So there's definitely that, that could be that thing of like, oh, I'll give you my apron 
and my leather gloves and my purple stockings and a stuff like that. But what is really interesting is, is that the thing that she talks about when, when Sybil's going over the list, the thing that she comes back to is like, oh, Rich, a cambric apron. It's like the, 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 the least the least exciting thing on the list is the thing that she's actually really super excited about. So I thought that was quite entertaining. Mm. Uh, Eric, I think. Yes. Well, I was going to say that it's interesting how that is the the sort of because there is that whole thing about the yellow silk curtains at home here in our, our old Ford house, which I was, I was trying to work out what was going on in that sort of um, you know, how many scarves is this guy wearing? <laughs> Here he wore a scarf, there he wore a scarf. Where he wore feathers, precious stones and jewels and sort of. And then like, so I, I'm just trying to picture the how abhorrent these yellow silk curtains are because it just sounds like he's wearing everything at the same time, obviously not. But um, yeah, also I was gonna say, isn't there a whole like line um, about a uh, cambric shirt in um, Scarborough Fair? Which might also, I mean, the song, not <laughs> which kind of might hark to something more folksy than anything else. And also, it would be, yeah, I, I think someone just mentioned in the chat, it would be the most practical item on the list. There's a good question here about how reliable Sybil is as a narrator about the description of Lacey. I mean, the production needs to make a decision on that. Is Sybil effectively just winding Rose up a little bit um, by, uh, throughout this exchange. Is there a playfulness to their, their back and forth because Sybil knows which buttons to push with her, uh, with her mistress? Um, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, knows that Rose is going to be sitting there doing poetry and just wants to slightly put, put a pin in the bubble a bit and just going, no, he's just a bloke. He's, you know, he just, no, actually, he's not massively over romantic and lovely. He just looks a bit of a tit, really. Um, and, and, but the production needs to make a decision on that. Is, is, is Sybil accurate? Um, and we may need to get more evidence on that. Um, there is no absolute as of yet in the text on that. Uh, Leaky. Well, if he does dress that flamboyantly, it'll certainly be much easier for him to disguise himself. Indeed. Which, is almost like you knew I needed a cue into the next scene. Um, uh, uh, we're going to run the next two scenes into each other because uh, uh, one is essentially a little prologue to the other. Uh, so scene three or act two, scene two. Uh, enter Lacey disguised like a Dutch shoemaker. How many shapes have gods and kings devised <laughs> thereby to compass their desired loves? It is no shame for Roland Lacey then to clothe his cunning with the gentle craft that, thus disguised, I may unknown possess the only happy presence of my rose. For her have I forsook my charge in France, incurred the king's displeasure, and stirred up rough hatred in mine uncle Lincoln's breast. O oh, love, how powerful art thou that canst change high birth to baseness, and a noble mind to the mean semblance of a shoemaker, but thus it must be for her cruel father, hating the single union of our souls, has secretly conveyed my rose from London to bar me of her presence. But I trust fortune and this disguise will further me once more to view her beauty, gain her sight here in Tower Street with ere the shoemaker mean I a while to work. I know the trade. I learned it when I was in Wittenberg. Then cheer thy hoping spirits. Be not dismayed. Thou canst not want. Do fortune what she can. The gentle craft is living for a man. And exit Lacey straight into scene four or act two, scene three. Enter air, making himself ready. <sighs> Where be these boys, these girls, these drabs, these scoundrels? They, they, they wallow in the fat brewers of my bounty and, and lick the crumbs up from my table, yet will not rise to see my walks cleansed. Come out, you powder que queens. What nan? What madge mumble crust? Come out, you fat midriff swag. Belly whores and sweep me these kennels that the noisome stench offend not the noses of my neighbors. What? Fuck, I say. What, Hodge? Open my shop windows. What? Fuck, I say. Enter Fuck. Oh, Master, is it you that speak, Bandog and Bedlam, this morning? 
I was in a dream and mused what madman was got into the street so early. Have you drunk this morning that your throat is so clear? Oh, well said, Buck. Well said, Buck. To work, my fine knave, to work. Wash thy face and I'll be more blessed. Let them wash my face that will eat it, good master. Send for a housewife if you'll have my face cleaner. And Away, so slobbing of all scoundrel. Ah, good morrow, Hodge. Good morrow, my fine foreman. Oh, master, good morrow. You are an early stir. Here's a fair morning. A good morrow, Firk. Oh, could have slept this hour. Here's a brave day towards. Oh, haste to work, my fine foreman, haste to work. Master, I am dry as dust to hear my fellow Roger talk of fair weather. Let us pray for good leather and let clowns and plowboys and those that work in the fields pray for braver days. We work in a dry shop. What care I if it rain? And enter Marjorie to really mess up my doubling. Ah, oh, how now, they Marjorie? Can you see to rise? Hey, trip and go. Come up, come up, do drabs your maids. Seen to right, I hope. It's time enough. It is early enough for any woman to be seen abroad. I marvel how many wives in Tower Street are up so soon. Oh, God's meat is not known. Here's a yawling. Ah, peace, Marjorie, peace. Where's Cicely Bumshrink at your maid? Yeah, she has a privy fall. She falls in her sleep. Call the queen up. If my men want shoe thread, I'll swing her up in the stirrup. Yet, that's but a dry beating. Here's still a sign of drought. Enter Lacey, disguised, singing. Devil's head and born van Gelderland, the frolic ZBN. He was as drunk he could not stand up. So CBN, tap in the canakin, drinks can a mannequin. Master, for my life, yonder's a brother of the gentle craft. If he bear not St. Hugh's bones, I'll forfeit my bones. Here's some uplandish workman. Hire him, good master, that I may learn some jibble, gabble, twill make us work the faster. Ah, peace work, a hard world. Yeah, let him pass, let him vanish. We have journey many now. Peace, my fine folk. And swapping hats back to be Marjorie again. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's my bad. Nay, nay, your best follow your man's counsel. You shall see what'll come on it. We have not men now, but we must entertain every butter box. But let that pass. Thank for God, if my master follow your counsel, he'll consume little beef. He shall be glad of men, and he can catch them. Aye, that he shall. For God, a proper man, and I warrant a fine workman. Master, farewell, dame, adieu. If such a man as he cannot find work, Hodge is not for you. And Hodge offers to go. <sighs> Stay, my fine Hodge. Hey, on your foreman go, Dane, you must take a journey to seek a new journeyman. If Roger Lee, if Roger remove, Firk follows. If St. Hugh's bones shall not be set a work, I may prick mine owl in the walls and go play. Fare ye well, master. Goodbye, Dane. Ah, uh, Harry Fine Hodge, my brisk foreman. S stay, Firk, peace, pudding broth. By the Lord of Luggett, I love my men as in my life. Peace, you Gallimaffrey. Hodge, if he want work, I'll hire him. One of you to me, to him. Stay, he comes to us. Good dark, maester, and of rock. Nails, if I should speak after him without drinking, I should choke. And you, friend Oak, are you of the gentle craft? Yeah, yeah, ich bin den schoolmaker. Then schoolmaker, quotha. And hark you, schoolmaker. Have you all your tools a good rubbing pin? 
a good stopper, a good dresser, your four sorts of owls, and your two balls of wax, your paring knife, your hand and thumb leathers, and good St. Hugh's bones to smooth up your work. Yeah, yeah, be not worried. Ich hab all the dingin for my schools, groot and clean. <laughs> Good master, hire him. He'll make me laugh so that I shall work more in mirth than I can in earnest. Hey, you friend. Have you any skill in the mystery of cord wainers? Ich wit nit what you said. Ich uh, verstau you nit. Why, thus man. Ik first you need copa. Ay, 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 can that well do it? Yeah, yeah. It makes me like a jackdaw that gapes to be fed with cheese curds. Oh, he'll give you a villainous pull at a can of double beer. But Hodge and I have the vantage. We must drink first because we are the eldest journeymen. What is thy name? Hans, Hans Mölte. Give me thy hand, thou art welcome. Hans, entertain him. Ferk, bid him welcome. Count Hans, run wife, bid your maids, your cholibubs, make ready my fine men's breakfast. To him, Hans. Hans, thou art welcome. Use thyself friendly, for we are good fellows. If not, thou shalt be fought with, wert thou bigger than a giant. Yea, and drunk with, wert thou gargantua. My master keeps no cowards, I tell thee. Oh, boy, bring him an eel block. Here's a new journeyman. And a boy. Oh, ich verste you. Ich mort in half a dozen cans betalen. Here, boy, nems this skilling tap in Sfrelik. Hmm? E exit, boy. Ick, snipper, snapper, away, Ferk, scour thy throat. Thou shalt wash it with Castilian liquor. Enter, boy. Come, my last of the five. Give me a can. Have to thee, Hans. Here, Hodge. Here, Ferk. Drink, ye mad Greeks, and work like true surgeon, Trojans, and pray for Simon Eyre, the shoemaker. Here, Hans, thou art welcome. Lo, dame, you would have lost a good fellow that will teach us to laugh. This beer came hopping in well. Simon, it is almost seven. It's so, Dame Clapper Dungeon. It's seven o'clock and my men's breakfast not ready. Trip and go, you soused conjure. Away, come your mad hamperians. Follow me, Hodge, follow me, Hans. Come after my fine fact to work, to work a while and then to breakfast. And exit air. Soft, yo, yo, good Hans. Though my master have no more wit but to call you for me, I am not so foolish to go behind you, I being the elder journeyman. And they exit. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, uh, Lacey pretending to be a shoemaker. Um, and uh, the the ultimate test to see whether he really is a shoemaker is for him to buy a round. <laughs> um, basically, there, uh, you know, boy comes on. Yeah, uh, shall we bring on a a, 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 a test of to to see if he can heal uh, a shoe? And he just goes, yes, boy, go and buy lots of beer. <laughs> At which point, everyone is delighted. Yes, he is one of us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a lot of wordplay here. There's a lot of things that seem like they're quietly referencing, uh, sort of. It sounds like they're referencing uh, names from uh, pl different plays in the past, but are just sort of generic names uh, the, the, uh, as well. So uh, when we hear Madge mumble crust, of course, we all we all smile inside. <laughs> Uh, but I particularly like uh, yes, uh, Sicily bum trinket. Uh, uh, <laughs> We haven't met Cicely Bum Trinket, have we? Um, there's an image in my mind, but uh, hey, what what can one do, Sarah? I I am a collector of ridiculous phrases, and I gave up with this scene. 
There were <laughs> so many great ones. I was just thinking, oh, I need to write that one down. Then it was like, oh, I need to write that one down. Oh no, I need to write that one down. Oh, I need to remember. They, they just came so thick and fast. It it was hilarious. And I I think this scene would land so well with a modern audience, especially a modern British audience. Just because of the whole thing of like, oh yeah, you're, you always know, got a round in. He's 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 yeah he's he's obviously he's he's a good guy. Um, it's just so ridiculous. Um, but but and and there's kind of like a kind of uh, obviously a bit of casual xenophobia with the mm. with the with the sort of fake Dutch dialect. But it, I don't know. I can just that would play probably very well to a British audience as well. Who knows? But I. It's sort of undercut I, because he's not he, he's he's pretending to be Dutch and there exactly. so, so so the the the, the comic confusion sort of doesn't have a a, a nasty target exactly it because it's like it's uh, it's like a layer on a layer and it, I, I I don't know I just thought that was a really fun scene and I also like the fact that the um the the really really funny um lines and phrases they weren't all in one mouth because you know like air is obviously uh, an extraordinary a uh, good character to play, I would imagine. Uh, but um, Ferk and Hodge as well had some absolutely hilarious, um, just just like little phrases that just create these amazing images in your mind. And um, the ho yeah, the whole thing just worked so well, I thought, and, and would land really well with a, I, with a contemporary audience. I mean, basically this scene has supplied uh, RuPaul with an entire <laughs> uh, brace of drag names because, uh, but you know, between Cicely Bum Trinket and uh, Dame Clapper Dungeon, um, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's the lot, <laughs> you know, there are more as well. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll go to Helen then, Eric. Um, what struck me very much was uh the the power dynamics of of the workshop because um air says no no i don't need another journeyman don't want him let him pass and uh both roger otherwise known as hodge and uh Ferk say no we want him okay we're off get yourself some more um yeah. journeyman yeah. and at yeah. which point he says oh sugar all right all right all right but stay and and i mean the, obviously this is far more mobility of labor i mean if they were apprentices obviously they couldn't do it but as journeymen they they seem pretty certain that their skills will get them a job wherever they want to go mm. um i mean that is a very interesting isn't it? Mm. Say I with my social history hat on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, like that. Uh, Eric, then Lynn, then Alan. Yeah, I, I was just enjoying the sort of small puns. Like, you know, this beer came hopping in well. And it's like, ah, see, I'm funny. You know, it, it's just sort of, it, it is that thing of if you pile on the sort of laughs, how it, it, it's going to hurt the audience sort of, I mean, you know, in, in the sides from all the laughing uh, by by the end of the scene but also it's kind of do you play it straight do you sort of i mean obviously how, how do you treat the scene because it's kind of i mean okay yeah just kind of lacy is overdoing it then air is overdoing it and then Ferk is just like juggling everything <laughs> trying to get a drink and not have to work basically <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think there's a real, you know, obviously we want the audience to laugh, but I do think there is a trap of going too broad with some of this um, because it, it, it I, 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 there is a danger there. Uh, Lynn, then Alan, then Sarah, then Rachel. Yeah, I, I think Helen's observation is super interesting because I'm also interested in in that sort of economic and, and social situation. But in this scene, it's, it's almost like there's a line missing somewhere. Lacey comes in singing or, or or something in in dutch he doesn't actually seem to say hi i'm from the netherlands and i know how to make shoes and i'm looking for work it's like the the foreman and the the journeyman say oh look let's hire that guy He's, he looks like he'd be a good worker and marge is on board with that you know it's they're all like oh let's give him a job without him even asking that i noticed and then of course the miserly 
CEO says, no, no, I, you guys just have to do Yeah, I, I, I have plenty of employees. I mean, it's that that's the economic dynamic even now that you try to to hire as few employees as possible to do as much work as possible. Um, but the but the employees in their, their sort of proto labor union said, hire this guy or we quit. Um, uh, but but Lacey never says he wants a, a job until further into the conversation. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I think a has got a response to that. OK, yeah, OK. I think he does. And I completely understand why you couldn't get it through my my thick attempt to read what this dialogue is written like. But I suspect and the you've oak is I'm looking for work. Oh, I think. <laughs> I, 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 it, it, it's his first line after he comes in. Guten Tag, Meister. And do you have work? Mm, do you yes, have work? yes, okay. yes, he does. He does. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I think the joke is that he comes in singing about drinking uh, and <laughs> they immediately go, ah, he's a shoemaker. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's not just that, you know, it, that he's Dutch. Oh. Um, you know, there's an expectation at the time of, you know, Dutch being heavy drinkers. Um, but um, that, no, they're just going, he's one of us. Uh, imp- we'll get him in because he'll be a crack, won't he? Um, so, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Alan, then Sarah, and then I've got lost. There are so many hands waving. Yeah, I mean, I, I get the feeling that Hodge is probably the the powerhouse of the business. He, he's the craftsman. Whereas Ayers, the front man, mm. um, he may well be trade, he probably would have been trade served, but I very much doubt that he's actually wielded a needle and all in um, seriousness for some while. It's Hodge and Firk who've been carrying the business. Mm. Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to answer Eric's question um, about how would you play this? I, if it was me directing it, I would play. I would get the actors to play it absolutely straight because it's like it's. It doesn't need anything else, really. It's just the lines are so funny. But also, like these people, like they don't think that they're funny. You know, half of the humor comes from the fact that they don't think they're funny. Um, you know, Air Air is. I mean, he does call himself mad early, early on, but like. Yeah, he's just who he is, and Hodge is who he is, and Ferk is who he is, and 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 the like. Humor t- tends to be more funny when people, when the people delivering it, uh, don't think it is. Mm. If that makes sense. I mean, sense. they are delivering jokes, but it's banter. It's but, not yeah, to it's, the audience get a laugh joke. Exactly. Um, it's like it's 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 the kind of it's the stuff that they probably do between them every day, and it's yeah. just like. It's, and and, and yeah, really every day really, really it's, fast and... it's the same joke every day as well. Yeah. In fact, if you were with them more for more scenes, you go, okay, we're a bit bored now of your yeah. <laughs> of yeah. your badinage. It's it's just like it's just who they are, and it's just this kind of thing that they have. So you'd want to do it just really fast and just because there, honestly, there are so many funny lines. If you if you if you played every one, also it would just take forever. Yeah, you know the the play would just take. We are not at home to Mr. Gaffor. We are only ho- <laughs> we are only looking for titters, a stable level of titters. That's what we're aiming for. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. If you play for everything, then it slows down and it becomes incredibly painful. Um, and I think Helen's point about the the social dynamic here that's going on. Uh, you need to understand that that they actually have some power in this relationship. Not obviously too much power, but enough power to talked uh air round um and that yeah that the, the, there are social dynamics at play that people have stakes even within comedy scenes and that there is something else going on uh rachel has been waving for ages yeah i uh i was just gonna say the dutch his what he what he was saying in dutch because uh Ferk, i think understands uh because there's some things that he's saying wrong in dutch uh that there's an understanding uh that he's not uh, maybe a uh, Dutchman completely. Like uh, when he comes in singing, he says there was a child from Gelderland and he frolic was uh, happy was he, he was drunk and he couldn't stand uh, something he was or something he is. Uh, then he starts talking about cans, drink, beautiful men or something like that, uh, beautiful people. Um, and then it gets down to him coming in and he says, good day uh my, my uh master 
I don't know what the next thing he says. And then he says, yes, yes, I am a shoemaker. Um, I'm not something. I have all the things for making shoes big and clean. You know, the bigness of the shoes. I don't know why that's important. Uh, and then he go. Uh, so I, there's I, some... Th yes. there's, a, there's a really nice bit later on when, uh, you know, Lacey says, you know, I do not know what you mean. And, yeah, and that's yeah. the and bit that like, Ferk says know. back at him and imitates going, I don't know what you mean. Um, and it's it, it's really nicely done. Which, uh, to a degree, you want the audience to know what the, what he's saying at that point. <laughs> Otherwise, the joke doesn't land. Uh, I'm afraid we need to move on, uh, Eric, uh, very briefly, but uh, uh, a brief. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say for the Dutch, you could just have like surtitles going that are sort of, yeah, or super titles. I don't know what they're called in English, where you go like sort of over, over the stage or under the stage if you want, uh, sort of like mistranslating <laughs> what is going on as well. So it could be even funnier if you really want it to. Um, and yeah, the st there is also the stereotype of sort of, you know, Dutchmen like cheese and drinking, basically. That's. Yeah, I don't know why. And I'm just wondering if this is after the spoil of Antwerp, which it probably is. Um, well, it, it, in, in historical terms, um, yes and no. Uh, so the... <laughs> the world of the play is, uh, is before, uh, the play itself is after. Um, uh, but it's also before the play of the Siege of Antwerp. So, um, yeah, um, it's... Um, it, it, yeah, it's a bit of a higgledy piggledy thing. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of what uh, Lacey is saying is just English. I mean, um, it's just with an accent. So uh, it, there's also an actor's choice of how you precisely pass that to make how clear you want it to be. Anyway, uh, we're going to move on. We're going to run the next two scenes into each other. Act two, scene four or scene five as a running numbering. There's hallooing within. Okay. Uh, no, I was, go I, was uh, I was playing for some hallooing. Hallooing within, please. Hello! Thank you. Enter Master Warner and Master Hammond, attired as hunters. Cousin, beat every break. The game's not far. This way, with winged feet, he fled from death, whilst the pursuing hounds, scenting his steps, find out his highway to destruction. Besides, the miller's boy told me even now he saw him take soil and he hallooed him affirming him to have been so embossed that long he could not hold. To be so, it's just best we trace these meadows by old ford. A noise of hunters within. Rah. Enter a boy. Now, now, boy, where's the deer? Speak, sawst thou him? Uh, oh, yea, I saw him leap through a hedge and then over a ditch. Then at my Lord Mayor's pale, over he skipped me, and in he went me. And hello, the hunters cried, and there, boy, there, boy, uh, but there he is, uh, uh, mine honesty. Boy, God a mercy. Cousin, let's away. I hope we shall find better sport today. And they exit into scene six or act two, scene five. Hunting within, enter Rose and Sybil. My Sybil, wilt thou prove a forester? Upon some, no. Forester go by, no, faith mistress. The deer came running into the barn through the orchard and over the pale. I wot well, I looked as pale as a new cheese to see him. But whip, says Goodman Pin, close up with his flail, and our nick with a prong, and down he fell, and they upon them, and I upon them. By my troth, we had such sport, and in the end, we ended him. His throat we cut, flayed him, unhorned him, and my Lord Mayor shall eat of him anon when he comes. Horn sound within. <laughs> hark, hark, the hunters come. Your best take heed. They'll have a saying to you for this deed. Enter Master Hammond, Master Warner, Huntsman and Boy. God save you, fair ladies. Ladies? Oh, gross. Aim not a buck this way. No, but two does. And which way went they? Faith will hunt at those. At those? Upon some no. When, can you tell? Upon some, eh? Good Lord. Wounds then farewell. Boy, which way went he? Uh, this way, sir, he ran. This way he ran indeed, fair Mistress Rose. Our game was lately in your orchard scene. Can you advise which way he took the flight? Follow your nose. His horns will guide you right. 
Sorry, it's a mad wench. No, <laughs> rich. Trust me, not I. It is not like that the wild forest deer would come so near to place of res places of resort. You are deceived. He fled some other way. Which way, my sugar candy? Can you show? Come up, good honey socks. Upon some, no. Why do you stay and not pursue your game? Oh, hold my life. Their hunting necks be lame. A deer more deer is found within this place. But not the deer, sir, which you had in chase. I chased the deer, but this deer chaseth me. The strangest hunting that ever I see. But where's your park? She offers to go away. Tis here. I stay. Impale me, and then I will not stray. They wrangle, wench. We are more kind than they. What kind of art is that, dear heart, you seek? A heart, dear heart. Whoever saw the like? To lose your heart, is it possible you can? My heart is lost. Alack, good gentleman. This poor lost heart would wish. I wish you might find. You, by such luck, might prove your heart a hind. Why, luck had horns, so I have heard some say. Now, God, and it be his will, send luck into your way. Enter, for some confusion, the Lord Mayor and his servants. What, Master Hammond? Welcome to Old Ford. God's pity, kids. Hands off, sir! Here's my lord. I hear you had ill luck and lost your game. It's true, my lord. I'm sorry for the same. Uh, what gentleman is this? My brother-in-law. You're welcome both. Since fortune offers you into my hands, you shall not part from hence until you have refreshed your wearied limbs. Go, Sybil, cover the board. You shall be guest to no good cheer, but even a hunter's feast. Oh, thank your lordship. Cousin, for my life, for our lost venison, I shall find a wife. And in exuant gent various people. In, gentlemen, I'll not be absent long. This Hammond is a proper gentleman, a citizen by birth, barely allied. How fit an husband were he for my girl? Well, I will in and do the best I can to match my daughter to this gentleman. And exit the Lord Mayor. So, yes, we have a, a, a sort of wooing -y scene uh, with uh, Rose involved, in which case we, we get different uh, verse, verse <laughs> play. We suddenly get rhyming. <laughs> we get all these shared lines. Uh, we, yeah, it's, um, it's, doing, it's doing a very interesting job of work, is the, the, the language of this scene. Um, and yeah, and uh, and and hunting, and yeah, we've we've definitely moved in a different direction here, and different things are going on. Uh, thoughts on the room about um, game lame place chase. Um... <laughs> I mean, it's it's sort of very obviously cheesy in so many ways. Uh, Eric, yeah, when the scene started, uh, with uh, I thought it was going to go in the direction of you know sort of the uh, Mer hundred merry tales with the Welshman uh, stealing the pouch from the highwayman instead of the deer instead of killing the deer, um, and it just kind of yeah it, it, it went in the direction that I did not expect, uh, but also a direction that I kind of did expect, which kind of disappointed me in a way, yeah. Uh, well, I have to say, I did find Sybil's speech actually moderately disturbing. Actually, <laughs> Sybil coming. Oh yeah, we uh, have you never uh, dealt with a deer before? Uh, this is the reality of hunting. Um, I, I'm a dab hand at all this. Uh, <laughs> whereas again, Rose going high fluting poetry. Sybil, Sybil, and then you cut, you stab it, and you cut it out, and you fit, <laughs> and you you know uh, flay it. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a leaky. I mean, I think she'll make Hammond a wonderful wife. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's Warner she's after. Is it Warner? Mm. I thought it was Hammond who was uh, flirting with her so ponderously. No, no think... it's, he's with Rose. Uh, oh, he's with Rose. Hammond is gone with a bit of posh. <laughs> Warner's gone for the servant. Mm. Uh, Helen. 
Hammond, I, I mean, coming at it cold, Hammond struck me as being unspeakably awful when you, you sidle up to a young lady and say, and call her my sugar candy. Oh, that was Warner. Oh, that's Warner. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. Ah, yeah. And yeah, it's you're interesting right. because right. in, in form, it doesn't look like Rose is necessarily telling uh, Hammond to get stuffed, actually. And mm. it, it, it's, yeah. uh, it, it no. didn't seem that way. I, mean, I don't Maybe I'm missing something. But then maybe she's just playing the game of courtly love, which is sort of what bits of this are. Uh, whereas Warner and Sybil, you know, my sugar candy, good honey sops. I mean, it's sickening, oh, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it but, uh, ah, yes, I'm sorry. I've totally misunderstood that scene. Happens, you know, happens. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, you know, first flashing run through. We're not expected uh, depth at this stage. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, what you just said, Rob, it's not clear what Rose is doing. I mean, I kind of tried to play her as snarky as I could, but you know, it's the problem of of this style of courtship, which we are still grappling with, is that no means yes. You know, how do you say no when no means yes, um, or no means try harder? I, so yeah, it's just it's it's problematic, and and I I don't know. We're introducing a rival to Lacey, evidently. So we'll kind of see how it unfolds, um, how you would play that scene, whether Rose really is trying to just like, hey, hey, go away, please go away, please stop flirting with me or she, or or what? Uh, it might just um, be a game to her. You know, this is yeah. she she speaks poetry all the time. And, you know, this you is go. just what you do in the forest when you're hunting. You you do yeah. um, you do this kind of uh, this this kind of uh, we need to move on in a moment. Sarah. Yes, I got the impression there were two very different things going on. Um, because on the one hand you have Rose with um, Hammond and I got, yeah, I got the impression that that was like this kind of courtly game, um, you know, of sort of, you know, words exchanged and nothing really ha happening. But then I think actually there was quite a lot of action going on probably with, with Warner and, and Sybil because although like she, she's, got, well, she's sort of giving as good as she gets with him, then she has that line, line, God's pitikins, hands off, sir. Here's my lord. Like, st stop pouring me because, like, I'll, I'll get, I'll get in trouble because his, you know, here's my employer. So I think they were probably by the, by the, by the time the Lord Mayor comes in, they were probably getting quite hot and heavy in the corner. Hmm. So um, it's sort of introductory, uh, you know, the uh, a, a, a rivalry uh, element. Uh, so we shall see where that goes. Uh, we're going to dive into the first scene of Act Three, depending on one layout of this. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, scene six, uh, last scene of the session. Um, uh, we got uh, Lacey returns disguised as hands. Uh, we have a new chap called Skipper, uh, Hodge and Firk. So we'll see how this goes. Excellent, what uh, second Hans? Uh, the skip that uh, coming from the candy is all vol by God's sacrament. Uh, Van sugar, seafit, almonds, cambric, and uh, all dingen, townsend, townsend ding. Nip it hangs, nip it for Meister, there the bills uh, van laden. Your Meister Simon Eyre shall he good copen. What second, your Hans? What second, the regen, the copen, slopen. Laugh, Hodge, laugh! My lever, brother, fig. Bring the Maester Eyre to the signe van Svaniken. There shall you find the skipper and me. What sagen you, brother, fig? Do it, Hodge. Come, skipper. And exit, uh, probably, Lacey and the skipper. Bring him, quoth you. Here's an unavery to bring my master to buy a ship worth the ladding of two or three hundred thousand pounds. Alas, that's nothing. A trifle. A bauble. Hodge. The truth is, for that the merchant owner of the ship dares not show his head, and therefore this skipper that deals for him, for the love he bears to Hans, offers my master heir a bargain in the commodities. He shall have a reasonable day of payment. He may sell the wares by that time and be a huge gainer himself. Yay. 
But can my fellow Hans lend my master 20 porpentines as an earnest penny? Portuguese, thou wouldst say, here they be for, hark, they jingle in my pocket like, like St. Mary over his bells. Enter Air and Marjorie. Mum, here comes my dame and my master shall scold on my life for loitering this Monday. But all's one, let them all say what they can. Monday's our holiday. You sing, Sir Sauce, but I beshrew your heart, I fear. For this your singing we shall smart. Smart for me, dame. Why, dame, why? Master, I hope you'll not suffer my dame to take down your journeyman. If she take me down, I'll take her up. Yay. And take her down to a buttonhole lower. Peace, Ferg. Not I, Hodge, by the life of Pharaoh, by the Lord of Ludgate, by this beard, every hair whereof I value at a king's ransom, she shall not meddle with you. Peace, your bombast cotton candle queen. Away, queen of clubs. Quarrel not with me and my men, with me and my fine Ferg. I'll Ferg you if you do. Yay. Yea, man, you may use me as you please, but let that pass. Let it pass, let it vanish away. Peace, am I not Simon Eyre? Are these not my brave men? Brave shoemakers, all gentlemen of the gentle craft. Prince, am I none? Yet I am I, nobly born, as being the sole son of a shoemaker? Ah, away, rubbish. Vanish, melt, melt like kitchen stuff. Yay, yay, tis well, I must be called rubbish, kitchen stuff, for a sort of knave. Nay, madame, you shall not weep and wail in woe for me. Master, I'll stay no longer. Here's an inventory of my shop tools. Adieu, master. Hodge, farewell. Nay, stay for thou shalt not go alone. I pray let them go. There be more maids than Malkin, more men than Hodge, and more fools than Fark. Fools, nails. If I tarry now, I would my guts might be turned to shoe thread. And if I stay, I pray God I may be turned to a Turk and set in Finsbury for boys to shoot at. Come, Firk. Stay, my fellow fine knaves, you, you arms of my trade, you pillars of my profession. What, shall a tittle tattle's words make you forsake Simon Eyre? Avant kitchen stuff, rip your brown bread tannikin out of my sight. Move me not, have I not tamed you from selling tripes in these cheap and set you in my shop and made your hair fellow with Simon Eyre the shoemaker? And now do you deal thus with the, my journeyman? Look, your powder beef queen on the face of Hodge. Here's a face for the Lord. And here's a face for any lady in Christendom. Rip, you chick laying. Avant, boy. Bid the tapster of the boar's head. Give me a dozen cans of beer for my journeyman. A dozen cans. Oh, brave. Hodge, now I'll stay. And the knave feels any more than two, he pays for them. A dozen cans of beer for my journeyman. Hear you, mad Mesopotamians, wash your livers with this liquor. Where be the odd ten? No more, Madge, no more. Well said. Drink and to work. What work dost thou, Hodge? What work? I am making a pair of shoes for my Lord Mayor's daughter, Mistress Rose. And I a pair of shoes for Sybil, my Lord's maid. I deal with her. Sybil? Fie, defile not thy fine workmanly fingers with the feet of kitchen stuff and basting ladies, ladies of the court, fine ladies. My lads, commit their feet to our power lane. Put gross work to Hans, yark and seam, yark and seam. For yarking and seeming, let me alone, and I come taught. Well, master, all this is from the bias. Do you remember the ship my fellow Hans told you of the skipper and he are both drinking at the swan. Here be the Portuguese to give him earnest. If you go through with it, you cannot choose, but be a lord at least. Nay, dame, if my master prove not a lord and you a lady, hang me. Yea, like enough, if you may loiter and tipple thus. Tipple, dame. 
<laughs> no, we have bargaining with Skellum Skanderbag. Can you Dutch Brecken for a ship of silk cypress laden with sugar candy? And enter boy with a velvet coat and an alderman's gown. Air puts them on. Peace, Ferg. Silence, tittle tattle. <laughs> Dutch, I'll go through with it. Here's a seal ring, and I've sent for the guarded gown and a damask cassock. See where it comes. Look here, Maggie. Hey, help me, Ferk. Pearl me, Hodge. Silk and satin, you mad Philistines. Silk and satin. <laughs> My master will be as proud as a dog in a doublet, all in beaten damask and velvet. Softly, Ferk, for rearing of the nap and wearing threadbare my garments. Hey, how dost thou like me, Ferk? How, dost, how do I look, my fine Hodge? Why, now you look like yourself, master. I warrant you there's few in the city, but will give you the wall and come upon you with the, with the right worshipful. Nails, my master looks like a threadbare cloak, new turned and dressed. Lord, Lord, to see what good raiment doth. Dame, dame, are you not in a moored? How sayest thou, Maggie? Am I not brisk? Am I not fine? Fine, by my troth, sweetheart, very fine. By my troth, I never liked thee so well in my life, sweetheart. But, but let that pass. I warrant there be many women in the city have not such handsome husbands, but only for their apparel. Uh, but let that pass too. And re-enter Lacey disguised as hands and skipper. Couldn't die, Master. This be the skipper that have the skip and merchandise. The commodity been good. Nept it, Master, nept it. Out of mercy, Hans. Welcome, Skipper. Where lies the ship of merchandise? The uh, skip uh, been in uh, river. Uh, do be van uh, sugar, uh, civet, almonds, cambric, and thousand, thousand things. Uh, got uh, sacrament. Uh, that didn't empty it, Master. Ye shall have good copen. Hmm? Hmm? To him, Master. Oh, sweet Master. Oh, sweet wares. Prunes, almonds, sugar candy, carrot roots, turnips. Oh, brave fatting meat. But not a man buy a nutmeg but yourself. Peace, Ferk. Come, Skipper, I'll go abroad with you. Hans, have you made him drink? Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, have uh, veal good, uh, good runk. Come, Hans, follow me. Skipper, thou shalt have my countenance in the city. And they exuant. Ja, hab viele getrunk, quoth I. They may well be called butter boxes. When they drink fat veal and thick beer too. But come, dame, I hope you'll chide us no more. No, faith, Ferk. No, pretty Hodge. I, I do feel honor creep upon me. And which is more <clears throat> certain rising in my flesh. But at that pass. Rising in your flesh do you feel, say you? Aye, you may be with child. But why should not my master feel a rising in his flesh, having a gown and a gold ring on? But you are such a shrew, you'll soon pull him down. <laughs> Privy peace. Uh, that makes my worship laugh. Let that pass. Hey, come, I'll go in. Uh, uh, Hodge, pretty go before me. Uh, Ferk, follow me. Ferk doth follow. Hodge, pass out in state. And they exit. I do love the way that Marjorie sort of uh, talks in Freudian slips uh, and, uh, <laughs> and has the pass. perfect get out. But let that pass. We'll just move on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so we've got two plot lines uh, sort of vying uh, in this scene. We've got the introduction of a plot line of buying some goods from uh, from uh, uh, the, the, the uh, skipper. Uh, I do love the thing, you know, where lies your ship? It's in the river. 
is his response. <laughs> and that he's really drunk. Um, clearly very, very drunk. Uh, but then we have in the middle of this, we have this labour relations dispute, <laughs> which is solved by bribing the workers with more beer. Um, <laughs> It's, it's just it's just clearly that Marjorie just keeps saying, do some work, and the workers do not like her telling them to do some work, and then basically say, no, we're walking out. Uh, it's uh, it's a walkout. Uh, sorry. Um, and Ed is constantly having to get his workers drunk, otherwise no work gets done. Uh, Lynn. Oh, just etymology footnote. The word Copen comes up a couple of times, just so everybody knows. Cope or Copen is is the Germanic root for like a business transaction. Mm. Copenhagen is Copenhagen. It's a, a businessman's haven. Our word cheap is related to that. So Copen is business is a business transaction. Yeah, so he says he's going to give you a good good deal. I'll give you a good yes. deal on, yes. on the goods. Uh, he's a motivated that. seller and I've got this, this ship full of luxury goods I'm going to sell you for a, a bargain price. And when you retail... That uh, this stuff, you will make a, a small fortune mm. and rise socially automatically. Very mm. Yes, and there's a lot of status stuff here. The moment Air puts on his uh, or, or his yeah. alderman's yeah. gown, and yeah. uh, and Marjorie just gets a little <laughs> hot under the collar. He looks <laughs> mighty fine there. Uh, a certain rising in my flesh, which um, in her mind, of course, it, 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 the, the, the aim of the line is to say, you know, a rising of my status, but the, but um, <laughs> Freudianly meaning something quite different. Um, so there's lovely double meanings there. Um, there's so much in this scene. Again, this is another one of those scenes where there's surface gags, but there's also lots of stuff underneath it. And it's building on the stuff we had earlier. Uh, and I just, yeah, I just love the walkout. I just love the way that as Helen said earlier, Hodge and Ferk are just controlling this business completely. I mean, they just don't want to do any work and they want to hire other workers to do the work for them. <laughs> it's clearly the whole point of them bringing uh, Hans into the room. <laughs> it's like a play about the birth of middle management. Yeah. Uh, Rachel. I was just going to say they've unionized. Yeah. They've got a whole union, a workers' union. I don't know, maybe you could <laughs> You could uh, decide saying this is a uh, comedy, uh, you know, maybe have a little discussion about unions because people are talking about unions again in the, U the U.S. Um, and there's people trying to break unions. And um, I think the Kellogg's uh, people who just were able to get themselves a union for their kids. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, it, there, there are definite, you know, uh, uh, union uh parallels that could go with this very nicely i mean it's it's a it's a much more complicated um early modern setup but um yeah i think the parallels can definitely be played um other thoughts about this final scene before going to final thoughts about the play overall so far helen yeah i cannot for the life of me remember which island candy is oh i should be able to find that for a minute. whether it's one of the mediterranean islands or whether we're actually going somewhere like ceylon it, it's crete it's, it's crete Mm. It's Crete, is it? Ah, right. Right. Yeah. Uh, other thoughts about the scene uh, before we go into final thoughts? Sugar was um, worth its weight in maybe not gold, but close. But, but mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the American historian Robert Buchholz um, says that uh, it, it's a little later in this period, but sugar was the oil of its day. It was the dominant commodity. Um, and I think that becomes true more when it starts to be cultivated in the new world, but, um, and coffee and tea become uh, socially important. But yeah, sugar is on the rise as an, an extremely valuable commodity and kind of just sort of dominating the market. Mm. Uh, okay, we're going to go into final thoughts, go around the room. Um, I, I think the general uh, feeling, or certainly what seems to be coming out the room, is that, yes, this is a comedy, there's a lot of good stuff to play, um, but not to forget the weight that, the, you know, that there is some reality behind this. Yes, it's comedic, so it's going to be slightly exaggerated, but uh, actually not running for those laughs seems to be where we're going. I mean, obviously in, in, in rehearsal and uh, in performance, maybe we'll be wrong, uh, but I get the impression we're, we're mostly enjoying this. It's got enough weight to it, but it's also got enough comedy business. Um, yeah, uh, thinking about this for performance uh, across 
media uh, in our usual way. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, it's a well-known play, and uh, I think we we know why uh, so far uh, from session number one. Helen, any final thoughts? Uh, no, it's it's it really what you said. It's it's got it's got something for everyone. I I'm I'm slightly unimpressed by the hero and heroine. <laughs> Um, I mean, Rose hasn't demonstrated any particular, um, given us any reason to be rooting for her. And Lacey is obviously uh, good looking and dresses nicely, but you wouldn't really want to have any, put any reliance on him. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like the the the, the slight romantic subplot in uh, Muppets of Christmas Carol when you know and you get to that song in the middle of the film and you just go no I'm not that interested I'm not that fast get back to the the singing and the dancing and and, and other things this is not the parallel I was aiming for there um uh, but yeah I, I I think you're right but there is a sl if anything they're the most absurdist of the thing because they're written in such highfalutin fashion. Um, that actually they don't feel very real, uh, or at least they feel affected. There's something about the affectation of Rose, which is, I think someone was talking about Nouveau Riche in the, um, in the chat. You know, they're not, they don't have that much depth uh, necessarily to, uh, uh, to, to them. So, uh, it, uh, but I could be wrong on that point. Uh, Dan, any final thoughts? Not many right now. Um, I'm enjoying the play. I think this is a good intro to Decker. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, I think that the audience should be able to relate well to these to these characters. I think everyone can relate to the story of or the idea of social climbing mm. and class divisions and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, in terms of how to play it, I'm, I'm definitely always in the middle of that kind of thing. You don't want to play too big because I, I think it's just less funny. If you if you try to hammer home comedy to people, I think that more subtle comedy usually lands better. Um, not to say that you don't hit it at all, just um, not not so much so that um, the audience isn't thinking every time. Okay, I got it. So yeah, just looking forward to tomorrow's reading. Mm. It's it's a really well realized world, and yes, this is our first play by Thomas Decker. I think I don't think he had a finger in any other plays that we've looked at. We've definitely done him he as far so as Lord Mayor's shows. Yeah. Um, we had the contribution. Uh, no, we didn't read it for Sir Thomas More. I think I don't know if I, I can't recall if we read it or not. We have done uh, Sir Thomas More, but yeah. you know that's the kind of text where we don't bother trying to pass on <laughs> piecemeal that, that one. That one was a definite Decker contribution. Yeah. That's not yeah. a dispute at all. So, but, anyway. Uh, but anyway, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't mess with that one. Uh, anyway, uh, Sarah, any final thoughts? Well, it's interesting because I've been doing these readings now for nearly two years and the two plays that I've kept hearing about throughout the last you know 23 months are The Night of the Burning Pestle and The Shoemaker's Holiday and it's interesting now we're actually well we've already just done um, Pestle and now we're doing this one and it's interesting because there does seem to be a, a, a slight parallel in terms of even though that's a later play in that the romantic plot like Helen said, it's really not that kind of impressive and I don't think it's meant to be. I mean, um, by the time we got to the end of Pestle, I was I was thinking, yeah, this is just like, this is actually like a, a, a sort of ironic take, like a satire on, on um, romantic comedy. And I'm wondering if, I mean, so far at least, this is looking like this, a similar kind of thing. Like nobody cares really about the hero and heroine. They are sort of off in a corner, you know, running their little plots uh, and, and like where we're interested, where the interest lies is, is, is in what's going on, uh, you know, with the shoemakers. Um, and and I, I loved what Lynn said about, is this gonna be a play about the birth of middle management? <laughs> I, just, I think yeah i think you could be right there lynn <laughs> actually there's actually like a lot of very interesting social stuff um going on in there and and that is seems to be where where the impetus for it lies and and i and i wonder if like the romance is just going to be like some kind of satirical nonsense that you know probably gets wrapped up at the end but nobody's going to care 
I don't uh, know because I haven't read it. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, we'll find out. There's still time for the final session to disappoint in the curse of the final session. Uh, <laughs> Alan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I must admit I'm getting the feeling that uh, Hodge and Firk were an established comic double act. Um, the way it flows on the page, I, I suspect that they are the two established comedians of the company. Um, and the comment on the, the young lovers, it's just reminding me of almost any modern or well, 20th century musical where the romantic leads or even going back earlier in the GNS, who were notorious for this, that the two romantic leads are basically, um, you know, you put them into a bit of block water and the blotting paper just dissolves. You know, they're, they're so thin as to be basically just a vehicle for other things going on. Mm. Uh, Eric, any final thoughts? I just want to know what Sybil is wearing because <laughs> it's just all this, you get all this elaborate description of the stuff she owns and the stuff she wants and like the stuff that Rose is giving her. I don't know, just there's so much stuff about materials and like clothing and I mean, okay, we've talked about the social status stuff, but it's just, I want to know what, what they were dressing people with in this play. It just seems like you have the opportunity for it to mess around with costumes so much. Yeah, it's an interesting question because you know Sybil won't have an occasion with which to wear any of the fine things that she gains. I mean, that's 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 the the the, the thing, or at least in theory, you know, she's not going to be able to run around with her mistress uh, wearing uh, a finery. It's just not gonna. It's just not gonna land. Uh, so, um, unless of course each scene that Sybil just acc uh, accumulates a, a finer and finer costume as she goes, and Rose actually is wearing less and less finery. <laughs> she's basically just keeps giving her her clothes. Um, I quite like that. It, it, it wouldn't probably land but um uh historically no, but, um... no no i think i think the purple stockings under a very plain gown mm. would make a statement uh sarah <laughs> well it, it just occurs to me as well that would actually explain why warner is like <laughs> hello you know yes exactly because like if she's actually because he actually says you know ladies and she goes what uh, if if she's actually doled up to the nines, maybe he yes. And maybe uh, what would then be really funny would be if he was actually expecting to do a sort of courtly little courtly love scene with her, the way the way Hammond's doing with Rose. <laughs> she just kind of grabs him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That 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 could actually be. That Especially as that I, could I, be a I, thing. I I see her sleeves covered in blood at this stage as well because she's yeah. just, just she's just slaughtered. Her. <laughs> This, this deer and, and and dressed it so uh yeah uh rachel any final thoughts um um yeah i just put like some of the stuff that they were saying in dutch like the in the chat so what lynn said about the the copen meaning business i think there's also the play on words because i think is it copen can also mean but like spelled differently can also mean cups so like, I think they're making a word play between doing business and just drinking in uh, some of this, uh, which they seem to be doing. I really like the little comedy workshop band side of it. And the, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited for tomorrow to go more into this, but there's so much I think you can play here and there's, um, such a realistic feel to some of this, like to to a lot of this. Mm, there's a real world at play here, and that's that's nice. It's grounded. It's got a bit of grounding to it. Uh, Lynn, any final thoughts? Yes, I, I like what you said about the the, the real worldness. That's I I'm really enjoying that glimpse into material culture, the clothing, all of the technical vocabulary that they use about shoemaking. I think that's all authentic about you know the 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 kind of cord that they use to sew and and someone says something about a bone and yes uh, leather workers used a bone scraper to prepare leather like all that technical stuff i think is accurate mm -hmm. so that's really that's just interesting to me um because the audience would the, tell them if they got it wrong I've, you know <laughs> I, I think we, we'd yeah. be really clear the kind oh. of audience watching this would would yeah, would go no. <laughs> so yeah so all of that just I, i'm enjoying um and and yes, what people have said about the the nominal um, core romance between Rose and Lacey, I 
it's there is a nominal spine, but Rose is a little damp. And Lacey is maybe you could make him interesting, but mostly he's just an heir to a modest fortune and very good looking. So there you go. Um, but the play is so interested in economics and that's fascinating to me about social mobility, about how people luck into money. Um, and these were actually areas of concern. They, they were phenomena about which there was a, a fair amount of anxiety from what I understand about the, the period and the, the deftness with which um, Dex, uh, Decker deals with those slightly touchy subjects uh, is, is, imp is impressing me. And uh, Aliki, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, I'm really interested in the relationship between uh, Rose and Sybil and the ways in which it mirrors the relationship between Ayres and Ayres and his workers. Again, we have uh, somebody who really controls the relationship in the subordinate role, and that will be a lot of fun to play with. Mm. Yeah, I see us pulling out the status games. Uh... Someone get out a pack of cards. Uh, okay. Uh, that's uh, it from the room. Uh, we will return to the Shoemaker's Holiday. We'll have two more sessions uh, to thoroughly digest it. Uh, it's going well so far. Let's hope it doesn't go all down the pan later on. Uh, if you've enjoyed uh, this uh, session, then uh, you can uh, follow our work. Uh, we're all available on online. We're on YouTube. We're a podcast. Uh, you can uh, support us by going to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash beyond Shakespeare. You can buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com forward slash beyond Shakespeare. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, Beyond Shakes uh, and uh, other uh, social media platforms as well. But we don't really put that much in that at the moment. Maybe in the future when you're seeing this, we'll have done a bit more on that. But uh, hey, what can you do? All that remains to thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone. And goodbye. I'll go jiggy joggy to London.